My name is Doug Bush. I really want to extend my welcome to you as well. And I'm looking forward to bringing this sermon today. We are completing, as the video said, our final week on the essentials where we're studying the essential quality of love, looking at Jesus as our example. Um, here at Grace Point, the Bible is always our source. It's infallible. It's 100% God's word. We know that it's living and active and true. It ties together perfectly. And why wouldn't it? It's inspired by God who is perfect and holy. We're certainly committed that our teaching is to be from the pulpit, to be biblical always. It's for education. It's for edification or in encouragement, and it's also for application. So you have a role to play in this as well. Some weeks we explore passages that are written by poets or kings or heroes of the faith, apostles, failed leaders, great leaders, humble servants. It's actually not every week that we examine a message that is specifically from the greatest, most important person in history, Jesus Christ himself. We actually don't every week just pour over his words. Well, today we're going to. Um, we're focused in this series on the aspects of the love of Christ in this series. We learned in, in week one that love serves. That was a way for us to connect to our, the instruction that we are to love one another. In week two, we were challenged that love overflows. That's an expression that when we have this love, we begin to outreach and the love overflows from us into our community. And then last week, Pastor Dan talked about love being offensive. And that was kind of hard to take until we understood the context. And that is that love speaks the truth. It confronts the spiritually overconfident. So love offends. By now, you probably have realized in your life, no matter what your age, loving others is not easy. Um, you can't do it in your own strength. You're naturally not wired to do it. Um, and I'm not talking about loving the lovely or loving the people that love you back or the ones who are easy to love. I'm talking about loving like Jesus. Loving like he loved is different. We need to follow his example if we're gonna fulfill his purpose for our life, his commandment for us to love others. We can only do that by modeling him. There are 31,102 verses in the Bible. We're not gonna go through all of them today. We are gonna go through 10 verses. Only 10 verses out of 31,102 verses. I would submit to you, these are some of the most consequential verses in the whole scripture. They're super meaningful to your life and mine because they address what it means and what it takes to follow him and be his disciple. If you're gonna love like Jesus, you're gonna need to be his disciple. Well, what is a disciple, first of all? Well, a disciple is a student a student who disciplines, that's the root word disciple, who disciplines themselves in the teaching and practices of another. There are all kind of gurus in the world and as a result, disciples. There's all sorts of disciples following all sorts of different wisdom and, and people uh, offering teaching and practices and methods of life and health and business and ministry and hobbies. It's going on all around us. It was the same back in Jesus's time. People would follow a particular rabbi or teacher, either because they liked what they said or it was thought provoking or they sought the wisdom from that teacher. Even when John the Baptist, who had a pretty big following, baptized Jesus, his disciples came to John the Baptist and said, hey, uh, the guy you baptized, he's starting to get a pretty big following up. How should we feel about that? And you may remember that John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he can increase. So being a disciple of a rabbi or of a teacher was very common in that day. Well, some things haven't changed. 
There are a lot of people competing for your attention and your allegiance, inviting you right now to be their disciple. It's important and it probably should be said really clearly here. If you're struggling with who to follow, you should recognize Jesus Christ is the greatest influencer. These are the words we use now, right? The influencer. He's the greatest influencer. Follow his example. And that's our mission at Grace Point, to make as many people as much like Jesus in the shortest time possible. And that's why we have a vision for a world full of healthy churches. We follow our example, Jesus. That's why we have a theme verse this year that we're going over in every service that we have together. It's 2 Corinthians 3.18. Now, as the substitute teacher, I brought along all the answers. I didn't make you have to... (laughs) I didn't make you have to fill in the blank. So we'll just read it together in its entirety, okay? Let's read it. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We are beholding and then being transformed. What are we being transformed into? Into the same image. In the transforming process, he is our model and our example. The transformation to be able to go from one degree to another comes from the Lord. He is the most compelling figure in human history, Jesus. The world celebrates his birth, his life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection, he's fully God, fully man. He lived, his interactions with people actually happened. And they're recorded in this book that has stood the test of time. And that's why we're gonna study the words from this book. But he was quite different. You see, Jesus was often very disruptive. His message was very unique. I'd actually tell you his message is a little bit jarring often. You might remember John 6, verse 60. I find this fascinating. I have two translations of this verse. You think about it. He would teach and many of his disciples, here's what the ESV says. When many of his disciples would hear his teaching, they would say, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to this? My favorite is New American Standard. So then many of his disciples, after they heard his teaching said, This statement is very unpleasant. (laughs) Who can listen to it? Well, today we're going to listen to it. So Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 35, that's our passage, these 10 verses. It presents one of Jesus's most challenging teachings on what it means to truly follow him. The message is simple, but not easy. I'll tell you what the message is. Love hates. Now, if you're thinking, wow, that is a strange message, you'd be right. It is a strange message. I'll I'll do my best to explain what this means. Here's what it means a little bit. Jesus's standard for being his disciple, for you being his disciple, it's going to shock you. That's why I say these 10 verses are so consequential. So as we walk through these verses, we're gonna consider three points. If you're taking notes, I'm just gonna give you the three points right now. First point, discipleship must be the priority. Discipleship must be the priority. That's point number one. Point number two, discipleship has a price. And point number three, discipleship must be preserved. Now, after we unpack each of those points, at the end, I'm gonna have a few questions for you. So get ready to reflect, and then we'll dive into the text and hear what Jesus has to say. So with that, you found your passage. Let's stand for the reading of God's word, Luke 14, beginning in verse 25. Now, great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers 
and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, the man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Lord, we ask you to very personally work in each person's heart at this moment. Help us lock in on this. Pay close attention as you say. If we have ears, we need to hear to hear the teaching and then to apply this teaching to our life. In your name, amen. Okay, you may be seated. Um, So the passage begins with a large crowd following Jesus. By now, you're probably not surprised at that. Can you kind of picture it? I like Major League Baseball, full stadium. Kind of a fascinating thing about Major League Baseball, different than football. Everybody's really just talking to the person next to them in a normal voice. But by the time you get 50,000 people doing that, it's kind of loud. Then there's a roar when something happens, then it kind of goes back. But can you just picture what it must have been like to be in a big crowd following Jesus? He definitely had the crowds. He had thousands of followers. The more he ministered, the bigger the crowds would get. The more he did miraculous signs and wonders. You know, the, the, the signs and wonders, he went viral before that was even a thing. You know, everybody knew what was going on and they flocked to him to see more, to be healed. He was the biggest thing going at the time. If Jesus were here today in our modern society, he'd be packing out stadiums every night. I have no doubt, but he was very different and he is very different. And there's no better example of that than these 10 verses and these statements he makes. You see, if you read closely these verses, I think you'd have to agree with me. He doesn't seem like he's that into crowds. Because this is not a message you would give to people if you wanted them to hurry up and sign up. I know the message I would give would be, hey, we gotta tone that down. We gotta make this more attractive. We had 4,000 people last night. Why don't we tweak this thing a little? I think we could get another thousand. But that he's not into crowds. Who says these kind of things to encourage more people to come? Now, they had needs and he was compassionate about the needs and he met the needs and he would address the needs, often physical needs. But he was there for a much bigger mission. He was there to fulfill their spiritual need. Verse 26, if if anyone comes to me, does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, yet even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. What a striking statement. Number one, discipleship must be the priority. He starts with family. He takes his first shot at the family unit. Now, the family unit is like the core of society. It's the, it's the main building block. It's the central organizing um, pillar of society. Your closest relationships, whether you like them or not, they're often your family. It's where you get your identity. At that time, it certainly was a maybe even more than today, a source of your livelihood, your income, your protection. Your family was your team. 
When we hear family now, we, we still ascribe that. We, we see a championship team and the, team and the uh, players are interviewed after. It's like, there's something special about that locker room. There's something special all year about the clubhouse. This was like a family. A corporate culture, a strong company, they grow. They're much more than a business. It's like a family. We say we're proud of, of this healthy church. We say Grace Point, much more than just a church, it's a family. If you're fortunate to have a strong group of close friends, you characterize, you say we're way more than friends. We're, we're like family. So Jesus takes his big opening shot at your family. That's a big deal. Why would he say hate your family? I mentioned earlier, love hates. Well, it's important that we understand what he means by hate. The word hate is not a word that now is commonly used to signify hostility. That was an Aramaic word at the time that people would have known, and and here's what it means. To love a great deal less, a significant amount less. He's saying, you must prefer me over everything else. Whatever you love, you must love it a lot less than you love me. Our love for him must be so great that all other relationships should pale in comparison or be hated in comparison. Now, some of you are saying, this is actually an easy one. If you only knew my family, this would be pretty easy, right? Right? And, and I sometimes think the same thing and I'm like, But then he goes on to say some tough words. You must hate your own life also. That's, now we're getting personal. Does that even seem feasible for you and me? If if you can't do this, you cannot be his disciple. It says it right there. So what are the things in your life that you hold in high regard? Maybe higher regard than Christ. Uh, Is it position? Is it your power? Is it your wealth that you've accumulated? Is it convenience? Maybe it's just being well thought of and well regarded. Maybe you've um, taken the Enneagram or the personality test. You're like, well, I'm an eight. I'm a three. I'm a five. I like being an achiever. I'm an optimist. I'm an advisor. I kind of, here's the stuff I like. I like my position, what I am and how people see me. When it comes to being Jesus's disciple, he's saying, hey, I'm the priority. Now, we also in our culture, we kind of value people that can balance everything. Job, career, personal ambition, helping others, serving in church. Actually, it's interesting too, because Jesus is saying, when it comes to being my disciple, it's not about balancing me with other things. It's about making me the highest priority. Where does Jesus rank for you? I'm a big college football fan. Every Sunday evening, after all the games are played during the week, the polls come out for the next week. The whole system's built on rankings. You have the Associated Press poll, and if you really wanna get into the details, that's 62 journalists and broadcasters that submit by like 5 p.m. who they think are ranked, and the algorithm runs it. And then people said, hey, that's just a bunch of writers. Let's get some real practitioners. So then there's the coaches poll. The coaches poll is all the Division I coaches. They send in their rankings, and then that runs the algorithm. But even that has a little bias because it's like, well, you're ranking a, high, a highly ranked opponent because you lost to them. That's going to help you. So we need a committee to figure it out. So the college football playoff committee, you'll be excited to know if you don't know already, that starting next week from November 8th to December 5th, next week, they'll have the playoff poll that comes out and it'll rank everybody. Now, the thing that fascinates me most about all these rankings, I like to look at them, it's not the top 25 that gets published. That's interesting. It's actually, there's another list right beneath it. These are teams that have just, they're just outside the top 25. They seem worthy of recognition, but not enough to be in the top 25. And you see next to their names, RV, receiving votes. It's important that we mention that this school, that school, this team, that team received some votes. 
If I gave you a ballot as you left here today and I said, by 8 p.m., send in your rankings, where would Jesus rank for you? Is he consensus number one? Is he in your top five? But he's, he's rising. Is he top 10? He's certainly top 25. Or maybe he's just receiving votes. If you're gonna be his disciple, he must be consensus number one. If a disciple is just being a casual follower, we'd all have it made, wouldn't we? I mean, Jesus is, is actually not looking for casual followers with casual or curious devotion. He demands he's the priority. Now, here's the good news. We don't have to pretend we're good enough and earn his favor. We just have to prioritize him. He, we're loved and forgiven. All of that's been settled. So you see, we put our love for him as a priority above our own life. That's what enables us to put all of this together from our series of focus and love others like he loves. We don't have anything to prove. He continues in verse 27. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Okay, so putting him in the number one spot isn't enough. This is Jesus saying true followership, true discipleship is going to cost you. It's gonna cost you dearly. Why do we know it's gonna cost you dearly? Well, he uses the cross, it's a symbol of death. The Romans used crucifixion as a deterrent as a symbol. I gotta tell you, I would be like a pretty good Roman citizen. I mean, if you showed me somebody getting crucified, my first question would be, what'd that guy do? And I would be sure not to do it. If we had for all the crimes in Naperville, it's carjacking, it's breaking and entering, it's robbery, it's abuse, it's domestic violence. If we just had a big old crucifixion down at the river walk, I gotta believe all this stuff would get cleaned up quick. <laughs> now, I'm not saying it's appropriate or proportional for every violation, but what Jesus is saying is, knowing that now, you know his reference, he's saying, you lay down, you put to death those things that are important to you, you prioritize me. Now you're the listener in the big crowd that's following. Who would want to follow a guy who's like, here's what it's gonna take. It's gonna take carry your cross daily. In this context, he's really calling us to die to ourselves. He's calling us to give up our own plans and desires, put those behind him substantially. Luke 9, 23, you'll recognize it. I wanna point out something. He said to all, he didn't say just to the fervent believers, the discipleship co disciples coaching them up. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit himself? It's not just about admiring Jesus as part of the crowd. It's not just about having him be the number one priority. Um, it requires us to take up our cross daily. Die to our old way of life and follow him. It's like he's pausing and saying, wait a minute, don't make a hasty decision. You wanna follow me? Are you sure you want to follow me? Discipleship has a price. Our second point, two parables illustrate this. He talks first about the man building a tower. Um, the man builds a tower, but it doesn't first estimate the cost. If he runs out of money halfway, essentially he's gonna be a laughing stock. It's foolish to jump into something when you don't know what it's gonna cost and you don't know that whether you can complete the task. I have a really close friend. He's a structural engineer at a big uh, transportation and logistics company. He is responsible for the technical, the staff, the project management, the cost of some major big projects in the country involving bridges and structures. 
He assesses the material, the design, the schedules, the loads, the features. How long does that have to last? How much traffic's gonna go over these bridges? How long, you know, all sorts of inputs so that it's fully functional, it's safe, it helps the infrastructure. Ultimately, with all the parameters, what's he responsible for? He and his team need to figure out how to complete it and what it's gonna cost. Completing these kind of projects are major commitments. They have major implications. Jesus then gives the example of going to war. A king goes to war. He says, I've got 10,000 troops. Can I handle the guy who's got 20,000 troops? Maybe I can, maybe I can't. But you certainly have to count the cost. If I can't win, I'm gonna send a delegation ahead and make peace. Who doesn't think through what something is going to cost before doing it. You don't do it for a bridge. You don't do it for a tower. You certainly don't do it when going into battle. Discipleship has a price. Verse 33, you say, well, what's the price? Show me the price, then I'll decide. Verse 33, in the same way, those of you who did not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Some of you have in the ESV, renounce, to abandon everything. Now, he's not calling us to simply give up certain luxuries and habits. I think sometimes we fail to understand that correctly. Here's the cost of being Jesus' disciple. You ready? Renounce everything, put it in subjection to him and his will. The bottom line is, The message for you and for me, Jesus is not interested in half-hearted followers. He wants those who have weighed the cost and determined to follow him. And that's what he's asking for. And this decision will truly help you love like him. Now, he may not require all of that literally. On the other hand, he might. It's a mindset of a disciple that is putting everything in subjection to the Lord. Now, that's not a very crowd-friendly message, if you ask me. It's not a feel-good message. It's a message that will benefit us greatly, bring us great joy, that what we will give up will pale in comparison to the prize we will receive. That's the joy and the blessing of being Jesus' disciple. My, uh, my grandfather and father would say, and I know it wasn't original, but I just will never forget, there is no easy believism. There, it doesn't exist. There is no easy believism. But being his disciple is gonna provide great blessing, great joy. It's gonna enable you to make a big impact. Point number three, discipleship must be preserved. In the last two verses, he says, salt is good. If it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's it's fit neither for the soil or the manure pile. It's thrown out. Salt in ancient times, maybe even more critical than today, was valuable for the soil. It was mixed in with various ingredients to help that fertilizer preserve, be able to be used for longer periods of time. It's used as a preservative, as it is today, as a seasoning agent, as it is today. It has useful properties. It flavors, it preserves from corruption. When, when, when Jesus speaks of salt losing his saltiness, he's referring to disciples who lose their fervor, they lose their distinctiveness, they lose their commitment, and thus they lose their ability to season life with his love his joy, his image. When we first commit to follow Jesus, uh, typically it's with a lot of zeal, a lot of excitement. But as life goes on, things creep in, we get distracted, the temptation to become complacent sets in. Jesus is warning us that if you lose your distinctiveness as his follower and you start to blend too much with the world, your discipleship is gonna become ineffective. It'll become ineffective at home, with your friends, with your kids, 
at the office or in your place of employment, even at church. Here's an even more blunt way to put it. If you lose your saltiness, you'll be useless. You'll be of no use. What does that mean? Well, you won't be able to stave off corruption or spoiling or unrighteousness or rot in your life. To maintain the saltiness, we need to stay rooted in Christ. This means regularly engaging in the spiritual disciplines, such as reading scripture, praying, confessing, fellowshipping with other believers. Here's some interesting data. According to Pew Research, 54% of Christians say they read their Bible one or two times a month or less. I was interested in the or less. So in the next level of data, 33% of those people would say, I read my Bible, Christians, I read my Bible seldom or never. That is a recipe for losing your saltiness. That's how to do it. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. There are great benefits, practical benefits. And why wouldn't there be for studying God's word and spending time in God's word? There's a great study from the Center for Biblical Engagement. It studied the impact of Bible reading on people age eight to 80. Some awesome confirmation that you wanna spend time in the word. You spend time in the word four to five times a week, you'll be 60% likely to view pornography. You'll be 70 plus percent less likely to have any sort of adulterous uh, engagement. You'll be 75% less likely to have a gambling addiction. You'll be 407% more likely to memorize scripture. 228% more likely to share your faith with another person. 231% more likely to disciple someone. Read your Bible four to five times a week. And what that really means is you're communing with Jesus. You're loving him more than the other things in your life. You draw near to Christ, you're being his disciple, you're being disciplined in the practices of Jesus. Now, hopefully you get the concept of love hates. You, you understand what it means. It's to prioritize him greater than all else. You see, when you realize all your possessions belong to him, it'll be a lot easier for you. It's not his money. It's not your money, it's his money. You'll be much more generous. You'll be much more apt to share. When you realize your time and your well-being and your health isn't yours, these are gifts from him, you will use those gifts on behalf of others. It's actually not complicated. It's just difficult. You'll have the privilege of using all that he's given you to show love to others. Essentially, you get self out of the way. You focus on others' interests. That is becoming like Jesus. That's what our key verse is all about. Now to close, I wanna just do a little business. I gave you three points and now I have three questions for you. So do whatever it takes to give yourself some solitary reflection. You can bow your head, you can close your eyes, whatever it takes for you to create some solitude and some really focused reflection. I have three questions for you. Number one, where does Jesus rank in your priorities? Is he a great deal more than anything else? Is he somewhere in the ranking? Is he just receiving votes? Whatever your answer, would you commit to putting him in his deserved place, greater than anything and everything else? Question number two. What is it costing you to be a disciple of Jesus? If it's not costing you anything, you may not be a disciple of Jesus. Whatever your answer, would you commit to counting the cost and then taking up your cross, making that sacrifice of your will and say, Lord, your will be done in my life, whatever the cost. Question number three, are you useful 
as a disciple? Are you useful? Are you a follower of Jesus who flavors your conversations and the circles you're in and the situations he places you in to be useful for him? What does that look like in your life? Whatever your answer, will you commit to determining right now you're gonna reflect his image as his disciple wherever you live, wherever you work, wherever you play? It's 10 verses out of 31,102 verses. It asks some very hard questions. But Jesus is calling us to this standard, requires this kind of commitment and sacrifice and self-denial. But being his disciple is the greatest joy. It's the greatest blessing. Whatever you trade for this, you've traded up for the ultimate prize. Let's be those kind of disciples who by God's grace, we were willing to lay down everything for the sake of the kingdom. Let's pray.